In my previous videos, I provided a brief explanation of the Rodin coil, which was derived from the vortex-based mathematics discovered by Marco Rodin. I then provided a view of some of the computational technology that I have developed in an effort to visualize, present, brainstorm, and model results on the lab bench. Now I will provide an introduction to the coils that I have built, and the driving circuit that I designed. This is the first coil that I have built. The form factor is a 10-inch polystyrene craft donut. A single iteration around this form requires 11 feet 1 inch. I used 30 or 32 gauge magnet wire, and each coil has 84 iterations. That's over 2,000 feet per coil. It took me two days to build it. I ran out of wire, so the shear line is not intact on the outermost surface. The resistance was too high to get decent performance off of my 12 volt power supply, so I built another coil. It is due to this coil that I state that the Rodin coil is a 12 turn Mobius strip. As you can see, the wire is tight enough and uniform enough that it looks like a flat strip of metal. As each coil makes its way through the center, it seems to flip or turn like a Mobius. This is my other coil. It was built with 26 gauge wire, has 48 iterations per coil, built on a 10 inch form also, and provides substantially less resistance. I am able to get enough current through this coil with my 12 volt power supply to experiment with, though it is still under an amper. However, once I can afford to, I will purchase a better power supply. I plan to coat the coils on it with epoxy, so that they may hold the form. Then remove the polystyrene so that I can explore the coil in three dimensions. As you can see, the shear line is intact on it. According to Marco Rodin, these coils are supposed to be powered a specific way. However, most if not all driver circuits that I have seen on YouTube do not adhere to it. The powering schema is meant to be divided into three stages. In stage one, coil one is to be on, and coil two is off. In stage two, Coil 2 turns on as soon as coil 1 turns off, and in stage 3, both coils are supposed to be off. The coils are also supposed to be powered in opposition, meaning that the input of coil 2 will move in a direction opposing that of coil 1. My electrical skills are self-taught, as my professional and academic background reside within the ever-changing realm of computer science and software engineering. However, after fruitlessly combing the net for a decent driver circuit strategy, I decided to utilize the knowledge that I have gained so far and attempt to develop my own. I was successful. Behold, my road and coil driver. I call it the multi-stage variable pulse oscillator. It consists of three 555 timers. These jumpers are for changing the capacitors for the timing sequence. The potentiometers are used to adjust the pulse frequency and duration. The strategy provides me with the opportunity to explore how the coils perform given these two specific traits, unlike all of the static circuits that I have seen out there. I believe that frequency and duration combinations need to be explored, as they are variable in nature. One timer, that I will call timer 1, is configured to be a stable with full range configurable duty cycle. It is connected to another, that I will call timer 2, that is configured to be a Schmidt trigger to invert the signal from timer 1. This means that when timer 1 is on, timer 2 will be off and vice versa. Timer 1 and timer 2 will always be 100% out of phase. The third, that I will refer to as timer 3, is configured to be monostable. Timer 2 is connected to it via edge triggering. I also have a push switch bypass on the edge trigger. So the sequence goes timer 1 will continue to pulse on a cycle based upon the capacitor jumpers and 4 potentiometers. When timer 1 turns off, timer 2 turns on signaling the edge trigger for timer 3. Timer 3's on time is configured based upon the capacitor jumpers and 2 potentiometers. I use LEDs as a crude way of showing the on and off time of each output. 
The vacuum tubes on my oscilloscope exploded during an experiment in which I used the high voltage output from an ignition coil to pound a caduceus coil, so I have no other way to see frequency. The odd part about that experiment was that the scope was not connected to anything, and the activity was about 4 feet away. The scope was on and when I would bring my hand within one and a half feet from the probe it registered waveforms in the order of a few hundred volts, though I was two feet away from the caduceus coil. I heard a pop and a fizz, then saw smoke and lightning coming from the chassis. Times are financially tough, so I cannot afford to purchase a new scope. I am willing to accept donations though. The capacitor banks for timers 1 and 3 include 3 times 1 microfarad, a 0.1 microfarad, and a 0.01 microfarad each. Multiple jumpers can be used to connect them in series to increase the capacitance. This will help me explore the characteristics of each phase in the powering scheme by generating slow pulses. When using the 0.01 microfarad caps, I am able to reach frequencies of sound. I believe that analyzing frequencies beyond that will require equipment that is far beyond my price range. I hope that, by releasing this information, someone with the proper funding and knowledge will be inspired to conduct research within the megahertz ranges. I believe that these ranges will be required to affect things on a subatomic scale without the need for psychic manipulation. I just hope that, if someone does conduct research in these ranges, they will be willing to publish this information and make it available to me. Coil that I intend to build will have an elongated vortex. I recall seeing a video on YouTube in which Mr. Roden complained about the coils being produced by experimenters are stranded, as he indicated the progressive windings of magnet wire. As such, each coil will be created using aluminum foil. Then, once I have the process down, I will use this copper foil. I will also use two polystyrene craft donuts, separated by sticks. I'm not sure how far apart I intend to space the donuts just yet. Unless I can find a wider donut somewhere, that I can place between them, the form of the toroid will be quite cylindrical. However, as I have previously mentioned, it is highly improbable that all toroids in nature are perfectly shaped. Thanks for watching.